I think it's appropriate to start with the good news, because you'll be hearing quite a lot of bad news during the evening. So the good news is, we ain't got this anymore. So again, back to 1952. It was this actual week in 1952, so whatever that is, 62 years ago, that this was London at midday on, uh, I think this was the 1st of December. And it was just awful. There had been pollution episodes before, but there was never one which was this bad in respect to the concentrations of pollution and for this long. And you've heard the statistics already. So this was a real eye-opener. It wasn't just politicians taking stick. It was everybody who was involved in society was thinking, what have we done wrong here? And of course, you've heard about the source of the pollution. We were very dependent on coal. As a nation, we were burning very poor quality coal. And you've heard about it being used to heat our homes. But of course, it was actually our main source of power generation as well. So this is the quiz. I usually show this slide to my, my students, most of which are under 20. They managed to get Battersea Power Station up there on, uh, on my left. Uh, down here, bottom right, what's that? It was originally called Bankside. Top right, thank you, Lots Road in Chelsea. And over here on the left, Deptford, or down, somewhere down in East London. We had all these power stations rightly situated on the river because that's how the coal came in and the waste went away and we used the water for coolant but they were in the city, right beside the people, and they were producing a lot of pollution. <clears throat> so when we had the 52 smog, that led to the introduction of the Clean Air Act, and the two primary pollutants, black smoke and sulfur dioxide, went away. So here's the data. It was, uh, that's the sulfur dioxide concentration, and you can see from introduction of the Act in 56, it fell dramatically, as did the black smoke concentrations. So that's, that's public policy in action. That's how good policy can be. And this was a real step change for our urban environments, not just London, but all our major cities that depended on, on, on coal for electricity generation. We had the benefit of North Sea gas, of course, but that's, that's, another, that's another story. That was just lucky timing. But, as you've heard, the issue has not gone away. It's just changed. As a human race, we're very good at generating problems for ourselves. And we ended up generating this new problem of a modern type of pollution. And every Easter now, and most autumns, we get pollution episodes like this. This was the 2011 one. But if you go to the media, the papers in 2012 or this year, we had exactly the same events. We have weather conditions which keep the pollution which we're generating in the city, in the city, and it builds up. And on these days, we get more people going to hospital, we get more people requiring medication, and we certainly get more people uh, whose health is being affected in, in a, an acute way. But this isn't the problem. The, I don't worry so much about this. The media worries about it, but it's not the problem. The problem is all the other days when you can't see this pollution. So it stays like this. And you don't often get to see the pollution unless you get into a vantage point above the city. So this is taken from St. Thomas's Hospital. Looking out across the city, there's Waterloo, looking towards the city. And I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but the sky is blue, but there is this sort of haze or smog that's sitting on the top of the city. And this is made up of very, very tiny particles not black smoke particles, but tiny, tiny carbon particles with complex chemistry on their surface, which are emitted from all the transport sectors that we have in the city. And it's made up of oxygen gases like nitrogen dioxide and in the spring and summertime ozone. So this is the modern pollution which has replaced the black smoke and replaced the sulfur dioxide and may actually be even more hazardous than, than those two pollutants, as we're beginning to learn. So why can't you see it as you walk about the place in, in, in the city? 
Well, it's simply size. The human eye can't see these tiny particles. They can't see the oxygen gases. And this is the, the illustration of this. If you take a hair from your head and you hold it up, and if your eyesight is as good as mine, you can just about focus on it. And that's because it's 60 microns in diameter. The particles that we're talking about, the biggest ones, are PM10, 10 microns in diameter. So you can get six of those across a human hair. But the majority of them are much smaller than that. They're PM2.5 or even smaller ultrafine particles. And these are the ones which we're now producing in very large amounts from our transport sectors. They weren't there before. The previous generation didn't suffer these in these sorts of quantities. They're new. We have produced these through the modern combustion engine in very, very large quantities in urban areas. So this is our new challenge. So in urban areas, it's traffic is the main source of the particles and of the nitrogen dioxide, which is associated with the fumes from traffic. It's not the only source of pollution, but it's the majority of the source. This is, I don't know if you recognize, but this is Oxford Street. We only have buses and taxis in Oxford Street, all diesel powered. So the, the concentrations of pollution there are particularly high. And just think of the number of people that are going up and down Oxford Street every day. The exposures are enormous. This is the Brompton Road in leafy West London. But even there, the roads are congested. In 2000, one in 10 new cars registered was a diesel vehicle. In 2012, six out of 10 new cars are a diesel vehicle. We have embraced diesel in a very big way in this country. Our public transport depends on it, and now most of our private transport is fueled by diesel. We can go into that in question time if you want why that is, why we've done it. So it's not surprising when you lure a pollution map across London, then it's it's the road network which lights up, because that's where the pollution is being produced. And this is nitrogen dioxide, 2010. Anything above 40 micrograms per meter cubed, i.e. anything that's yellow or red, is above the limit value. It's above the EU limit value, and it's above the WHO health guideline. So you can see the majority of, of, of uh, inner London here, and it's moving out and along the major uh, routes are exceeding uh, the limit values for health. So that's, that's the size of the problem. It's the same for particles as well, uh, which we have the strongest health evidence for. So what's the bottom line here? What is this doing to us as, as a society? Well, the evidence, as you heard, was looked at by this committee here, COMEP, the Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollution. It's a Department of Health expert committee. They examined all the evidence in 2010, and their conclusion is that particles generated by humans are responsible for 29,000 deaths per year in the UK. 29,000 premature deaths. Or, if you want to put it another way, the life, loss of life expectancy of six months for all of us. But that's just a statistic. We know that. Some people are losing a few days of life, and some people are losing probably 11, 12 years of life. And it will depend on their exposure, and it will depend on their natural resilience to deal with these, these pollutant challenges. So it's a whole range of effects. So I was asked to think about some of the, thing, the, the ways in which we can deal with this problem. And of course, our two mayors, Ken Livingstone and Boris Johnson, have had to come up with air quality policies. So if transport is the big issue, then clearly reducing traffic volumes, which the congestion charge is meant to do, and reducing the emissions from individual vehicles, which is the low emission zones goal, these seem like very good policies to, uh, to bring into a major urban area. It's like removing the power stations out of the, out of the city to a, a certain extent. The bottom line is they haven't been really effective enough because they're not nearly ambitious, ambitious enough. So that's a real challenge and something, again, we can discuss. What else can you do? Well, as well as congestion charging and low emission zones, clearly we've got to get our bus fleet uh, cleaner and the current mayor is trying to do that. 
but the size of the problem is 8,000 buses. He's retrofitted just under 1,000 of them, and even those aren't that clean, really. They're still emitting a lot of pollution. So there's still lots of, of polluting buses out there. Taxis are the same. There's 22,000 of those. Over half of them are still what we call Euro 3 standard. They're not that clean. Other things we can do, clearly better integrated transport links, uh, construction industry, we've got a lot of that in London, uh, but it is beginning to slowly to clean up its act. Get more people out of their cars, get them on the cycles, you've heard that all before, but we need safe cycle lanes to be able to do that, to give people the confidence. And then one of my own uh, pet loves, when I travel around Europe, many of the old medieval cities now are pedestrianised, and they're very pleasant environments to be in. We don't need to, uh, if we're making a journey of half a mile or something, we don't need to get into a taxi or in a bus. Walk it and get the exercise and enjoy, enjoy the scenery. Thank you very much for your attention. I seem to remember when diesel for cars was coming in, uh, we were told that this was going to be cleaner, greener, more healthy. Um, from what you're saying, that was a big mistake. What, what went wrong? So that decision was based on one particular pollutant, carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. and it was driven by the climate change agenda. And it is true that in the late 90s, early 2000s, a diesel vehicle at the time gave you better mileage per gallon uh, and roughly produced about 10% less CO2 per mile. That difference quickly disappeared as engine technology developed. And in fact, for several years now, there's been no real benefit from a CO2 point of view in, mm. in diesel vehicles. The other thing that's happened is that our, the private cars have become a lot more powerful. And as a result, they're producing a lot more pollution as a consequence of that. So for some reasons, it was the right policy decision if you were just interested in CO2 and climate change. But holistically, the government should have been listening to all the advice and then different decisions would have been made. Mm -hmm. Were you giving that advice at the time? Yes. And they weren't listening? I, I wasn't shouting loud enough, as many of my colleagues obviously weren't either. Okay. All right, Can that's I all. Just, it. Ed, there's another a yep. interesting thing there. Uh, so one might ask, why all the diesel in the EU and much less diesel in the US? Mm. Because the entire um, transport fleet largely here is based on diesel or has been moving even more towards diesel in recent years. Mm -hmm. And in the US, um, it's been petrol-based largely, except for heavy goods vehicles. And um, one of the reasons for that was uh, an accidental gift to farmers in Europe after World War II. So uh, the idea was that uh, European farmers after the war needed uh, help and there was a decision, a policy decision, not to tax diesel, which was primarily used at that point just for tractors and other farm vehicles. Mm -hmm. So red uh, diesel. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and therefore, the lack of tax meant that it was a very cheap fuel. That was another push, uh, essentially a market yeah. push, uh, to, for Europe to go to diesel, uh, which didn't happen elsewhere, uh, didn't happen in the US anyway. 